Flight by John Steinbeck. About 15 miles below Monterey, on the wild coast, the Torres family had their farm. A few sloping acres above a cliff that dropped to the brown reefs and to the hissing white waters of the ocean. Behind the farm, the stone mountain stood up against the sky. The farm buildings huddled like the clinging aphids on the mountain skirts, crouched low to the ground as though the wind might blow them into the sea. The little shack, the rattling, rotting barn, were gray-bitten with sea salt, beaten by the damp wind until they had taken on the color of the granite hills. Two horses, a red cow and a red calf, Half a dozen pigs and a flock of lean, multicolored chickens stocked the place. A little corn was raised on the sterile slope, and it grew short and thick under the wind, and all the cobs formed on the landward sides of the stalks. Mama Torres, a lean, dry woman with ancient eyes, had ruled the farm for ten years, ever since her husband tripped over a stone in the field one day and fell full length on a rattlesnake. When one is bitten on the chest, there is not much that can be done. Mama Torres had three children, two undersized black ones of 12 and 14, Emilio and Rosie, whom Mama kept fishing on the rocks below the farm when the sea was kind and when the truant officer was in some distant part of Monterey County. And there was Pep, the tall, smiling son of 19, A gentle, affectionate boy, but very lazy. Pep had a tall head, pointed at the top, and from its peak, coarse black hair grew down like a thatch all around. Over his smiling little eyes, Mama cut a straight bang so he could see. Pep had sharp Indian cheekbones and an eagle nose, but his mouth was as sweet and shapely as a girl's mouth, and his chin was fragile and chiseled. He was loose and gangling, all legs and feet and wrists, and he was very lazy. Mama thought him fine and brave, but she never told him so. She said, Some lazy cow must have got into thy father's family, else how could I have a son like thee? And she said, When I carried thee, a sneaking lazy coyote came out of the brush and looked at me one day. That must have made thee so. Pep smiled sheepishly and stabbed at the ground with his knife to keep the blade sharp and free from rust. It was his inheritance, that knife, his father's knife. The long, heavy blade folded back into the black handle. There was a button on the handle. When Pep pressed the button, the blade leaped out ready for use. The knife was with Pep always, for it had been his father's knife. One sunny morning, when the sea below the cliff was glinting and blue and the white surf creamed on the reef, when even the stone mountains looked kindly, Mama Torres called out the door of the shack. Pep, I have a labor for thee. There was no answer. Mama listened. From behind the barn, she heard a burst of laughter. She lifted her full long skirt and walked in the direction of the noise. Pep was sitting on the ground with his back against a box. His white teeth glistened. On either side of him stood the two black ones, tense and expectant. Fifteen feet away, a redwood post was set in the ground. Pep's right hand lay limply on his lap, and in the palm, the big black knife rested. The blade was closed back into the handle. Pep looked smiling at the sky. Suddenly, Emilio cried, Yeah! Pep's wrist flicked like the head of a snake. The blade seemed to fly open in midair, and with a thump, the point dug into the redwood post, and the black handle quivered. The three burst into excited laughter. Rosie ran to the post and pulled out the knife, and brought it back to Pep. He closed the blade and settled the knife carefully in his listless palm again. He grinned self-consciously at the sky. Yeah! The heavy knife lanced out and sunk into the post again. Mama moved forward like a ship and scattered the play. All day you do foolish things with the knife. 
like a toy baby, she stormed. Get up on thy huge feet that eat up shoes. Get up. She took him by one loose shoulder and hoisted at him. Pep grinned sheepishly and came half-heartedly to his feet. Look, Mama cried. Big Lazy, you must catch the horse and put on him thy father's saddle. You must ride to Monterey. The medicine bottle is empty. There is no salt. Go thou now, Peanut. Catch the horse. A revolution took place in the relaxed figure of Pep. To Monterey me, alone? She scowled at him. Do not think, big sheep, that you will buy candy. No, I will give you only enough for the medicine and the salt. Pep smiled. You will put the hat band on the hat? She relented then. Yes, Pep, you may wear the hat band. His voice grew insinuating. And the green handkerchief, Mama? Yes, if you go quickly and return with no trouble. The silk green handkerchief will go if you make sure to take off the handkerchief when you eat so no spot may fall on it. See, Mama, I will be careful. I am a man. Thou a man? Thou art a peanut. He went to the rickety barn and brought out a rope and he walked agilely enough up the hill to catch the horse. When he was ready and mounted before the door, mounted on his father's saddle that was so old that the oaken frame showed through torn leather in many places. Then Mama brought out the round black hat with the tooled leather band, and she reached up and knotted the green silk handkerchief about his neck. Pep's blue denim coat was much darker than his jeans, for it had been washed much less often. Mama handed up the big medicine bottle and the silver coins. That for the medicine, she said, and that for the salt, that for a candle to burn for the papa, that for dulces for the little ones. Our friend Mrs. Rodriguez will give you dinner and maybe a bed for the night. When you go to the church, say only ten paternosters and only twenty-five Ave Marias. Oh, I know, big coyote. You would sit there flapping your mouth over Aves all day while you looked at the candles and the holy pictures. That is not good devotion to stare at the pretty things. The black hat, covering the high-pointed head and the black-thatched hair of Pep, gave him dignity and age. He set the rangy horse well. Mama thought how handsome he was, dark and lean and tall. I would not send thee now alone, thou little one, except for the medicine, she said softly. It is not good to have no medicine, for who knows when the toothache will come, or the sadness of stomach. These things are... Adios, Mama, Pep cried. I will come back soon. You may send me often alone. I am a man. Thou art a foolish chicken. He straightened his shoulders, flipped the reins against the horse's shoulder, and rode away. He turned once and saw that they still watched him, Emilio and Rosie and Mama. Pep grinned with pride and gladness and lifted the tough buckskin horse to a trot. When he had dropped out of sight over a little dip in the road, Mama turned to the black ones, but she spoke to herself. He is nearly a man now, she said. It will be a nice thing to have a man in the house again. Her eyes sharpened on the children. Go to the rocks now. The tide is going out. There will be abalones to be found. She put the iron hooks into their hands and saw them down the steep trail to the reefs. She brought the smooth stone matate to the doorway and sat grinding her corn to flour and looking occasionally at the road over which Pep had gone. The noonday came and then the afternoon when the little ones beat the abalones on a rock to make them tender and Mama patted the tortillas to make them thin. They ate dinner as the red sun was plunging down towards the ocean. They sat on the doorsteps and watched a big white moon come over the mountaintops. Mama said, He is now at the house of our friend Mrs. Rodriguez. She will give him nice things to eat and maybe a present. Emilio said, Someday I too will ride to Monterey for medicine. Did Pep come to be a man today? Mama said wisely, A boy gets to be a man when a man is needed. 
Remember this thing. I have known boys 40 years old because there was no need for a man. Soon afterward, they retired. Mama in her big oak bed on one side of the room, Emilio and Rosie in their boxes full of straw and sheepskins on the other side of the room. The moon went over the sky and the surf roared on the rocks. The roosters crowed the first call. The surf subsided to a whispering surge against the reef. The moon dropped towards the sea. The roosters crowed again. The moon was near down to the water when Pep rode on a wounded horse to his home flat. His dog bounced out and circled the horse, yelping with pleasure. Pep slid off the saddle to the ground. The weathered little shack was silver in the moonlight, and the square window of it was black to the north and east. Against the east, the piling mountains were misty with light. Their tops melted into the sky. Pep walked wearily up the three steps and into the house. It was dark inside. There was a rustle in the corner. Mama cried out from her bed. Who comes? Pep, is that thou? See, si, Mama. Did you get the medicine? See, si, Mama. Well, go to sleep then. I thought you would be sleeping at the house of Mrs. Rodriguez. Pep stood silently in the dark room. Why do you stand there, Pep? Did you drink wine? See, si, Mama. Well, go to bed and sleep out the wine. His voice was tired and patient, but very firm. Light the candle, Mama. I must go away into the mountains. What is this, Pep? You are crazy. Mama struck a sulfur match and held the little blue burr until the flames spread up the stick. She set light to the candle on the floor beside her bed. Now, Pep, what is this you say? She looked anxiously into his face. He was changed. The fragile quality seemed to have gone from his chin. His mouth was less full than it had been. The lines of the lip were straighter. But in his eyes, the greatest change had taken place. There was no laughter in them anymore, nor any bashfulness. They were sharp and bright and purposeful. He told her in a tired monotone, told her everything, just as it happened. A few people came into the kitchen of Mrs. Rodriguez. There was wine to drink. Pep drank wine. The little quarrel the man started towards Pep, and then the knife. It went almost by itself. It flew. It darted before Pep knew it. As he talked, Mama's face grew stern, and it seemed to grow more lean. Pep finished. I am a man now, Mama. The man said names to me I could not allow. Mama nodded. Yes, thou art a man, my poor little Pep. Thou art a man. I have seen it coming on thee. I have watched you throwing the knife into the post, and I have been afraid. For a moment her face had softened, but now it grew stern again. Come, we must get you ready. Go awaken Emilio and Rosie. Go quickly. Pep stepped over the corner where his brother and his sister slept among the sheepskins. He leaned down and shook them gently. Come, Rosie. Come, Emilio. The mamma says you must arise. The little black ones sat up and rubbed their eyes in the candlelight. Mama was out of bed now, her long black skirt over her nightgown. Emilio, she cried. Go up and catch the other horse for Pep. Quickly now, quickly. Emilio put his legs in his overalls and stumbled sleepily out the door. You heard no one behind you on the road, Mama demanded. No, Mama. I listened carefully. No one was on the road. Mama darted like a bird about the room. From a nail on the wall, she took a canvas bag and threw it on the floor. She stripped a blanket from her bed and rolled it into a tight tube and tied the ends with string. From a box beside the stove, she lifted a flour sack half full of black string jerky. Your father's black coat, Pep. Here, put it on. Pep stood in the middle of the floor watching her activity. She reached behind the door and brought out the rifle, a long 3856, worn shiny the whole length of the barrel. Pep took it from her and held it in the crook of his elbow. Mom brought a little leather bag and counted the cartridges into his hand. Only ten left, she warned. You must not waste them. Emilio put his head in the door. Qui est el caballo, mamá? Put on the saddle from the other horse. Tie in the blanket. Here, tie the jerky to the saddle horn. Still, Pep stood silently watching his mother's frantic activity. His chin looked hard, and his sweet mouth was drawn and thin. His little eyes followed Mama about the room, almost suspiciously. Rosie asked softly, Where goes Pep? 
Mama's eyes were fierce. Pip goes on a journey. Pip is a man now. He has a man's thing to do. Pip straightened his shoulders. His mouth changed until he looked very much like Mama. At last the preparation was finished. The loaded horse stood outside the door. The water bag dripped a line of moisture down the bay shoulder. The moonlight was being thinned by the dawn, and the big white moon was near down to the sea. The family stood by the shack. Mama confronted Pep. Look, my son, do not stop until it is dark again. Do not sleep even though you are tired. Take care of the horse in order that he may not stop of weariness. Remember to be careful with the bullets. There are only ten. Do not fill thy stomach with jerky or it will make thee sick. Eat a little jerky and fill thy stomach with grass. When thou comest to the high mountains, if thou seest any dark watching men, go not near to them, nor try to speak to them, and forget not thy prayers. She put her lean hands on Pep's shoulders, stood on her toes, and kissed him formally on both cheeks. And Pip kissed her on both cheeks. Then he went to Emilio and Rosie and kissed both of their cheeks. Pep turned back to Mama. He seemed to look for a little softness, a little weakness in her. His eyes were searching, but Mama's face remained fierce. Go now, she said. Do not wait to be caught like a chicken. Pep pulled himself into the saddle. I am a man, he said. It was the first dawn when he rode up the hill towards the little canyon which led a trail into the mountains. Moonlight and daylight fought with each other, and the two warring qualities made it difficult to see. Before Pep had gone a hundred yards, the outlines of his figure were misty, and long before he entered the canyon, he had become a gray, indefinite shadow. Mama stood stiffly in front of her doorstep, and on either side of her stood Emilio and Rosie, they cast furtive glances at Mama now and then. When the gray shape of Pep melted into the hillside and disappeared, Mama relaxed. She began the high, whining keen of the death wail. Our beautiful, our brave, she cried. Our protector, our son is gone. Emilio and Rosie moaned beside her. Our beautiful, our brave, he is gone. It was the formal wail. It rose to a high, piercing whine and subsided to a moan. Mama raised it three times, and then she turned and went into the house and shut the door. Emilio and Rosie stood wondering in the dawn. They heard Mama whimpering in the house. They went out to sit on the cliff above the ocean. They touched shoulders. When did Pep come to be a man? Emilio asked. Last night, said Rosie. Last night in Monterey. The ocean clouds turned red with the sun that was behind the mountains. We will have no breakfast, said Emilio. Mama will not want to cook. Rosie did not answer him. Where is Pep gone, he asked. Rosie looked around at him. She drew her knowledge from the quiet air. He has gone on a journey. He will never come back. Is he dead? Do you think he is dead? Rosie looked back at the ocean again. A little steamer drawing a line of smoke sat on the edge of the horizon. He is not dead, Rosie explained. Not yet. Pip rested the big rifle across the saddle in front of him. He let the horse walk up the hill, and he didn't look back. The stony slope took on a coat of short brush, so that Pip found the entrance to a trail and entered it. When he came to the canyon opening, he swung once in his saddle and looked back but the houses were swallowed in the misty light. Pep jerked forward again. The high shoulder of the canyon closed in on him. His horse stretched out his neck and sighed and settled to the trail. It was a well-worn path. Dark, soft leaf mold earth strewn with broken pieces of sandstone. The trail rounded the shoulder of the canyon and dropped steeply into the bed of the stream. In the shallows, the water ran smoothly glinting in the first morning sun. Small round stones on the bottom were as brown as rust with sun moss. In the sand along the edges of the stream, a tall, rich, wild mint grew, 
Well, in the water itself, the crests, old and tough, had gone to heavy seed. The path went into the stream and emerged on the other side. The horse sloshed into the water and stopped. Pep dropped his bridle and let the beast drink of the running water. Soon the canyon's sides became steep, and the first giant sentinel redwoods guarded the trail. Great round red trunks bearing foliage as green and lacy as ferns. Once Pep was among the trees, the sun was lost. A perfumed and purple light lay in the pale green of the underbrush. Gooseberry bushes and blackberries and tall ferns lined the stream, and overhead the branches of the redwoods met and cut off the sky. Pep drank from the water bag, and he reached into the flour sack and brought out a black string of jerky. His white teeth gnawed at the string until the tough meat parted. He chewed slowly and drank occasionally from the water bag. His little eyes were slumberous and tired, but the muscles of his face were hard set. The earth of the trail was black now. It gave up a hollow sound under the walking hoofbeats. The stream fell more sharply. Little waterfalls splashed onto the stones. Five-fingered ferns hung over the water and dropped spray from their fingertips. Pep rode half over his saddle, dangling one leg loosely. He picked a bay leaf from a tree beside the way and put it into his mouth for a moment to flavor the dry jerky. He held the gun loosely across the pummel. Suddenly he squared in his saddle, swung the horse from the trail, and kicked it hurriedly up behind a big redwood tree. He pulled up the reins tight against the bit to keep the horse from whinnying. His face was intent and his nostrils quivered a little. A hollow pounding came down the trail, and a horseman rode by, a fat man with red cheeks and a white stubble beard. His horse put down his head and blubbered at the trail when it came to the place where Pep had turned off. Hold up, said the man, and he pulled up his horse's head. When the last sound of the hoofs died away, Pep came back into the trail again. He did not relax in the saddle anymore. He lifted the big rifle and swung the lever to throw a shell into the chamber, and then he let down the hammer to half cock. The trail grew very steep. Now the redwood trees were smaller, and their tops were dead. Bitten dead where the wind had reached them. The horse plodded on. The sun went slowly overhead and started down towards the afternoon. When the stream came out of a side canyon, the trail left it. Pep dismounted and watered his horse and filled up his water bag. As soon as the trail had parted from the stream, the trees were gone, and only the thick brittle sage and manzanita and chaparral edged the trail. And the soft black earth was gone too, leaving only the light tan broken rock for the trail bed. Lizards scampered away into the brush as the horse rattled over the little stones. Pep turned in his saddle and looked back. He was in the open now. He could be seen from a distance. As he ascended the trail, the country grew more rough and terrible and dry. The way wound about the bases of the great square rocks. Little gray rabbits skittered in the brush. A bird made a monotonous high creaking. Eastward, the bare rock mountain tops were pale and powder dry under the dropping sun. The horse plodded up and up the trail toward the little V in the ridge which was the pass. Pep looked suspiciously back every minute or so, and his eyes sought the tops of the ridges ahead. Once in a white barren spur, he saw a black figure for a moment, but he looked quickly away, for it was one of the dark watchers. No one knew who the watchers were, nor where they lived, but it was better to ignore them and never to show interest in them. They did not bother one who stayed on the trail and minded his own business. The air was parched and full of light dust blown by the breeze from the eroding mountains. Pep drank sparingly from his bag and corked it tightly and hung it on the horn again. The trail moved up the dry shale hillside, avoiding rocks, dropping under cliffs, climbing in and out of old water scars. When he arrived at the little pass, he stopped and looked back for a long time. No dark watchers were to be seen now. The trail behind was empty. Only the high tops of the redwoods indicated where the stream flowed. Pip rode on through the pass, 
His little eyes were nearly closed with weariness, but his face was stern, relentless, and manly. The high mountain wind coasted, sighing through the pass, and whistled on the edges of the big blocks of broken granite. In the air, a red-tailed hawk sailed over close to the ridge and screamed angrily. Pep went slowly through the broken, jagged pass and looked down on the other side. The trail dropped quickly, staggering among broken rock. At the bottom of the slope, there was a dark crease, thick with brush, and on the other side of the crease, a little flat, in which a grove of oak trees grew. A scar of green grass cut across the flat, and behind the flat, another mountain rose, desolate with dead rocks and starving little black bushes. Pep drank from the bag again, for the air was so dry that it encrusted his nostrils and burned his lips. He put the horse down the trail. The hooves slipped and struggled on the steep way, starting little stones that rolled off into the brush. The sun was gone behind the westward mountain now, but still it glowed brilliantly on the oaks and on the grassy flat. The rocks in the hillside still sent up waves of heat they had gathered from the day's sun. Pep looked up at the top of the next dry, withered ridge. He saw a dark form against the sky, a man's figure standing up on top of a rock, and he glanced away quickly not to appear curious. When a moment later he looked up again, the figure was gone. Downward the trail was quickly covered. Sometimes the horse floundered for footing, sometimes set his feet and slid a little way. They came at last to the bottom, where the dark chaparral was higher than Pep's head. He held up his rifle on one side and his arm on the other side to shield his face from the sharp, brittle fingers of the brush. Up and out of the crease he rode, and up a little cliff. The grassy flat was before him, and the round, comfortable oaks. For a moment he studied the trail down which he had come, but there was no movement and no sound from it. Finally he rode out over the flat to the green streak, and at the upper end of the damp he found a little spring welling out of the earth and dropping into a dug basin before it seeped out over the flat. Pep filled his bag first, and then he let the thirsty horse drink out of the pool. He led the horse to the clump of oaks, and in the middle of the grove, fairly protected from sight on all sides, he took off the saddle and the bridle and laid them on the ground. The horse stretched his jaws sideways and yawned. Pep knotted the lead rope about the horse's neck and tied him to a sapling among the oaks, where he could graze in a fairly large circle. When the horse was gnawing hungrily at the dry grass, Pep went to the saddle and took a black string of jerky from the sack and strolled to an oak tree on the edge of the grove, from under which he could watch the trail. He sat down in the crisp, dry oak leaves and automatically felt for his big black knife to cut the jerky. But he had no knife. He leaned back on his elbow and gnawed at the tough, strong meat. His face was blank, but it was a man's face. The bright evening light washed the eastern ridge, but the valley was darkening. Doves flew down from the hills to the spring, and the quail came running out of the brush and joined them, calling clearly to one another. Out of the corner of his eye, Pep saw a shadow grow out of the bushy crease. He turned his head slowly. A big spotted wildcat was creeping toward the spring, belly to the ground, moving like thought. Pep cocked his rifle and edged the muzzle slowly around. Then he looked apprehensively up the trail and dropped the hammer again. From the ground beside him, he picked an oak twig and threw it towards the spring. The quail flew up with a roar and the doves whistled away. The big cat stood up. For a long moment, he looked at Pep with cold yellow eyes, and then fearlessly walked back into the gulch. The dust gathered quickly in the deep valley. Pep muttered his prayers, put his head down on his arm, and went instantly to sleep. The moon came up and filled the valley with cold blue light, and the wind swept rustling down from the peaks. The owls worked up and down the slopes, looking for rabbits. Down in the brush of the gulch, a coyote gabbled. The oak trees whispered softly in the night breeze. Pep started up listening. His horse had whinnied. The moon was just slipping behind the western ridge, 
leaving the valley in darkness behind it. Pep sat tensely, gripping his rifle. From far up the trail, he heard an answering whinny and the crash of shod hooves on the broken rock. He jumped to his feet, ran to his horse, and led it under the trees. He threw on the saddle and cinched it tight for the steep trail, caught the unwilling head and forced the bit into the mouth. He felt the saddle to make sure the water bag and the sack of jerky were there. Then he mounted and turned up the hill. It was velvet dark. The horse found the entrance to the trail where it left the flat and started up, stumbling and slipping on the rocks. Pep's hand rose up to his head. His hat was gone. He had left it under the oak tree. The horse had struggled far up the trail when the first change of dawn came into the air, a steel grayness as light mixed thoroughly with dark. Gradually, the sharp, snaggled edge of the ridge stood out above them, rotten granite tortured and eaten by the winds of time. Pep had dropped his reins on the horn, leaving direction to the horse. The brush grabbed at his legs in the dark until one knee of his jeans was ripped. Gradually, the light flowed down over the ridge. The starved brush and rock stood out in the half-light, strange and lonely in such high perspective. Then there came warmth into the light. Pep drew up and looked back, but he could see nothing in the darker valley below. The sky turned blue over the coming sun. In the waste of the mountainside, the poor dry brush grew only three feet high. Here and there, big outcroppings of unrotted granite stood up like moldering houses. Pep relaxed a little. He drank from his water bag and bit off a piece of jerky. A single eagle flew over, high in the light. Without warning, Pep's horse screamed and fell on its side. He was almost down before the rifle crash echoed up from the valley. From a hole behind the struggling shoulder, a stream of bright crimson blood pumped and stopped and pumped and stopped. The hooves threshed on the ground. Pep lay half-stunned beside the horse. He looked slowly down the hill. A piece of sage clipped off beside his head, and another crash echoed up from side to side of the canyon. Pep flung himself frantically behind a bush. He crawled up the hill on his knees and on one hand. His right hand held the rifle up off the ground and pushed it ahead of him. He moved with the instinctive care of an animal. Rapidly, he wormed his way towards one of the big outcroppings of granite on the hill above him. Where the brush was high, he doubled up and ran. But where the cover was light, he wriggled forward on his stomach, pushing the rifle ahead of him. In the last little distance, there was no cover at all. Pep poised, and then he darted across the space and flashed around the corner of the rock. He leaned, panting against the stone. When his breath came easier, he moved along behind the big rock, until he came to a narrow split that had offered a thin section of vision down the hill. Pep lay in his stomach and pushed the rifle barrel through the slit and waited. The sun reddened the western ridges now. Already the buzzards were settling down toward the place where the horse lay. A small brown bird scratched in the dead sage leaves directly in front of the rifle muzzle. The coasting eagle flew back towards the rising sun. Pep saw a little movement in the brush far below. His grip tightened on the gun. A little brown doe stepped daintily out on the trail and crossed it and disappeared into the brush again. For a long time, Pep waited. Far below, he could see the little flat and the oak trees and the slash of green. Suddenly, his eyes flashed back at the trail again. A quarter of a mile down there had been a quick movement in the chaparral. The rifle swung over. The front sight nestled in the V of the rear sight. Pep studied for a moment and then raised the rear sight a notch. The little movement in the brush came again. The sight settled on it. Pep squeezed the trigger. The explosion crashed down the mountain and up the other side, and then came rattling back. The whole side of the slope grew still. No more movement. And then a white streak cut into the granite of the slit, and a bullet whined away and a crash sounded up from below. Pep felt a sharp pain in his right hand. A sliver of granite was sticking out from between his first and second knuckles, and the point protruded from his palm. 
Carefully, he pulled out the sliver of stone. The wound bled evenly and gently. No vein or artery was cut. Pip looked into a little dusty cave in the rock and gathered a handful of spider web. And he pressed the mass into the cut, plastering the soft web into the blood. The flow stopped almost at once. The rifle was on the ground. Pep picked it up, leaving a new shell into the chamber, and then he slid into the brush on his stomach. Far to the right he crawled, and then up the hill, moving slowly and carefully, crawling to cover and resting, and then crawling again. In the mountains, the sun is high in its arc before it penetrates the gorges. A hot face looked over the hill and brought instant heat with it. The white light beat on the rocks and reflected from them and rose up quivering from the earth again, and the rocks and the bushes seemed to quiver behind the air. Pep crawled in the general direction of the ridge peak, zigzagging for cover. The deep cut between his knuckles began to throb. He crawled close to a rattlesnake before he saw it, and then it raised its dry head and made a soft beginning whirr. He backed up and took another way. The quick gray lizards flashed in front of him, raising a tiny line of dust. He found another mass of spider web and pressed it against his throbbing hand. Pep was pushing the rifle with his left hand now. Little drops of sweat ran to the ends of his coarse black hair and rolled down his cheeks. His lips and tongue were growing thick and heavy. His lips writhed to draw saliva into his mouth. His little dark eyes were uneasy and suspicious. Once, when a gray lizard paused in front of him on the parched ground and turned its head sideways, he crushed it flat with a stone. When the sun slid past noon, he had not gone a mile. He crawled exhaustedly a last hundred yards to a patch of high sharp manzanita crawled desperately, and when the patch was reached, he wriggled in among the tough, gnarly trunks and dropped his head on his left arm. There was little shade in the meager brush, but there was cover and safety. Pep went to sleep as he lay, and the sun beat on his back. A few little birds hopped close to him and peered and hopped away. Pep squirmed in his sleep, and he raised and dropped his wounded hand again and again. The sun went down behind the peaks, and the cool evening came, and then the dark. A coyote yelled from the hillside. Pep started awake and looked about with misty eyes. His hand was swollen and heavy. A little thread of pain ran up the inside of his arm and settled in the pocket of his armpit. He peered about and then stood up, for the mountains were black and the moon had not yet risen. Pep stood up in the dark. The coat of his father pressed on his arm. His tongue was swollen until it nearly filled his mouth. He wriggled out of the coat and dropped it in the brush, and then he struggled up the hill, falling over rocks and tearing his way through the brush. The rifle knocked against stones as he went. Little dry avalanches of gravel and shattered stone went whispering down the hill behind him. After a while, the old moon came up and showed the jagged ridge top ahead of him. By moonlight, Pep traveled more easily. He bent forward so that his throbbing arm hung away from his body. The journey uphill was made in dashes and rests, a frantic rush up a few yards and then a rest. The wind coasted down the slope, rattling the dry stems of the bushes. The moon was at meridian when Pep came at last to the sharp backbone of the ridge top. On the last hundred yards of the rise, no soil had clung under the wearing winds. The way was on solid rock. He clambered to the top and looked down the other side. There was a draw like the last below him, misty with moonlight, brushed with dry struggling sage and chaparral. On the other side, the hill rose up sharply and at the top, the jagged, rotten teeth of the mountain showed against the sky. At the bottom of the cut, the brush was thick and dark. Pep stumbled down the hill. His throat was almost closed with thirst. At first, he tried to run, but immediately he fell and rolled. After that, he went more carefully. The moon was just disappearing behind the mountains when he came to the bottom. He crawled into the heavy brush, feeling with his fingers for water. 
There was no water in the bed of the stream, only damp earth. Pep laid his gun down and scooped up a handful of mud and put it in his mouth. And then he spluttered and scraped the earth from his tongue with his finger, for the mud drew at his mouth like a poultice. He dug a hole in the stream bed with his fingers, dug a little basin to catch water. But before it was very deep, his head fell forward on the damp ground and he slept. The dawn came and the heat of the day fell on the earth, and still Pep slept. Late in the afternoon, his head jerked up. He looked slowly around. His eyes were slits of weariness. Twenty feet away in the heavy brush, a big tawny mountain lion stood looking at him. Its long, thick tail waved gracefully. Its ears were erect with interest, not laid back dangerously. The lion squatted down on its stomach and watched him. Pep looked at the hole he had dug in the earth. A half inch of muddy water had collected in the bottom. He tore the sleeve from his hurt arm with his teeth and ripped out a little square, soaked it in the water and put it in his mouth. Over and over he filled the cloth and sucked it. Still the lion sat and watched him. The evening came down, but there was no movement in the hills. No birds visited the dry bottom of the cut. Pep looked occasionally at the lion. The eyes of the yellow beast drooped as though he were about to sleep. He yawned, and his long, thin red tongue curled out. Suddenly his head jerked around and his nostrils quivered. His big tail lashed. He stood up and slunk like a tawny shadow into the thick brush. A moment later, Pep heard the sound the faint far crash of horses' hoofs on gravel. And he heard something else, a high whining yelp of a dog. Pip took his rifle in his left hand, and he glided into the brush almost as quietly as the lion had. In the darkening evening, he crouched up the hill towards the next ridge. Only when the dark came did he stand up. His energy was short. Once it was dark, he fell over the rocks and slipped to his knees on the steep slope. But he moved on and on up the hill, climbing and scrambling over the broken hillside. When he was far up towards the top, he lay down and slept for a little while. The withered moon shining on his face awakened him. He stood up and moved up the hill. Fifty yards away, he stopped and turned back, for he had forgotten his rifle. He walked heavily down and poked about in the brush, but he could not find his gun. At last he lay down to rest. The pocket of pain in his armpit had grown more sharp. His arms seemed to swell out and fall with every heartbeat. There was no position lying down where the heavy arm did not press against his armpit. With the effort of a hurt beast, Pep got up and moved again towards the top of the ridge. He held his swollen arm away from his body with his left hand. Up the steep hill he dragged himself, a few steps and a rest, and a few more steps. At last he was nearing the top. The moon showed the uneven sharp back of it against the sky. Pep's brain spun in a big spiral up and away from him. He slumped to the ground and lay still. The rock ridge top was only a hundred feet above him. The moon moved over the sky. Pep half turned on his back. His tongue tried to make words but only a thick hissing came from between his lips. When the dawn came, Pep pulled himself up. His eyes were sane again. He drew his great puffed arm in front of him and looked at the angry wound. The black lion ran up from his wrist to his armpit. Automatically, he reached in his pocket for his big black knife, but it was not there. His eyes searched the ground. He picked up a sharp blade of stone and scraped at the wound, sawed at it, sawed at the proud flesh, and then squeezed the green juice out in big drops. Instantly, he threw back his head and whined like a dog. His whole right side shuddered at the pain, but the pain cleared his head. In the gray light, he struggled up the last slope to the ridge and crawled over and lay down behind a line of rocks. Below him lay a deep canyon exactly like the last, waterless and desolate. There was no flat, no oak trees, not even a heavy brush in the bottom of it. And on the other side, a sharp ridge stood up, 
thinly brushed with starving sage, littered with broken granite. Strewn over the hill, there were giant outcroppings, and on the top, the granite teeth stood out against the sky. The new day was light now. The flame of the sun came over the ridge and fell on Pip where he lay on the ground. His coarse black hair was littered with twigs and bits of spider web. His eyes had retreated back into his head. Between his lips, the tip of his black tongue showed. He sat up and dragged his great arm into his lap and nursed it, rocking his body and moaning in his throat. He threw back his head and looked up into the pale sky. A big black bird circled nearly out of sight and far to the left. Another was sailing near. He lifted his head to listen, for a familiar sound had come to him from the valley he had climbed out of. It was the crying yelp of hounds, excited and feverish on a trail. Pep bowed his head quickly. He tried to speak rapid words, but only a thick hiss came from his lips. He drew a shaky cross on his breast with his left hand. It was a long struggle to get to his feet. He crawled slowly and mechanically to the top of a big rock on the ridge peak. Once there, he rose slowly, swaying to his feet and stood erect. Far below, he could see the dark brush where he had slept. He braced his feet and stood there, black against the morning sky. There came a ripping sound at his feet. A piece of stone flew up and a bullet droned off into the next gorge. The hollow crash echoed up from below. Pep looked down for a moment and then pulled himself straight again. His body jarred back. His left hand fluttered helplessly towards his breast. The second crash sounded from below. Pep swung forward and toppled from the rock. His body struck and rolled over and over, starting a little avalanche. And when at last he stopped against a bush... The avalanche slid slowly down and covered up his head.